Roger, copy. Eagle, Houston, you're go for landing, over. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today at this wonderful celebration. I'm coming to you from a distant planet called Canada, and I'm being beamed to you through a sci-fi device, and my uh, words are being translated into your language by Ansible. Who is Ursula Le Guin to modern literature? Well, she's very well loved and uh, well read in the Earth Sea world, which um, people often put on a YA shelf, but as, as you know, uh, good YA books are read up and read down, so younger kids read them and, and adults read them. And uh, that uh, is a series that started with the first three books, and uh, beginning with The Wizard of Earth Sea, and then later on she continued it on and built it out. But I would say that sits pretty close to the center of her work. But also she wrote at the same time a novel called The Left Hand of Darkness, uh, which was a very early look at gender fluidity in, in fiction. Her dragons are the best dragons. There's a, there's a range in dragons, you know, everywhere from, from the bazookas of uh, Game of Thrones. They don't talk, they don't have philosophies, they don't have a language. Um, they're not magic, particularly. They're flamethrowers. So on, on the one end, to the traditional sort of greedy, uh, gold-protecting dragon of The Hobbit, to the kind of dragon that you slay in Beowulf, uh, but Ursula K. Le Guin's dragons are a different order of dragon altogether. Um, so I can't do dragons of any kind, and hers are the best dragons. I did once ask her a question that she was unable to answer. Uh, there's a famous story of hers called The Ones Who Walked Away from Omelas. And uh, it is a perfect utopian city, but, it, but it's based on uh, in order to exist, there have to be uh, some tortured children. And the ones who walk away from Omelas are walking away from that. Uh, they refuse to accept utopia at the price of, of the suffering of others. So my question to her was, where do the ones who walk away from Omelas go? And her answer was, nice weather we're having. <laughs> When people first started writing utopias, they put them on islands. And then all the islands got discovered, so you couldn't do that anymore. And, and then they, they located some of them underground. People fell down tunnels into them. But then we learned a bit too much about what underground is really like. And, and the whole enterprise of, of uh, concocted societies moved to outer space and the future, both of them. Um, because nobody can tell you you got it wrong. So they, they are like blueprints, um, concocted societies. They're either blueprints of the bad, that is, this is where you do not wish to live, or blueprints of the good, maybe things would be better this way. And, and she did both. Well, I would like Ursula Le Guin to speak for herself from her latest book, which is called No Time to Spare. And this piece is called About Anger. She wrote it in October 2014. In the consciousness-raising days of the second wave of feminism, we made a big deal out of anger, the anger of women. We praised it and cultivated it as a virtue. We learned to boast of being angry, to swagger our rage, to play the fury. We were right to do so. We were telling women who believed they should patiently endure insults, injuries, and abuse that they had every reason to be angry. We were rousing people to feel and see injustice, the methodical mistreatment to which women were subjected, the almost universal disrespect of the human rights of women, and to resent and refuse it for themselves and for others. Indignation, forcibly expressed, 
is an appropriate response to injustice. Indignation draws strength from outrage, and outrage draws strength from rage. There is a time for anger, and that was such a time. So she was a straight-from-the-shoulder commentator uh, on all sorts of things, including politics and, and um, social structure and um, just anything that, that might present itself to her very intelligent, uh, sharp, uh, no-bullshit mind. Anger points powerfully to the denial of rights, but the exercise of rights can't live and thrive on anger. It lives and thrives on the dogged pursuit of justice. Anger continued on past its usefulness becomes unjust, then dangerous. Nursed for its own sake, valued as an end in itself, it loses its goal. It fuels not positive activism, but regression, obsession, vengeance, self-righteousness. Corrosive, it feeds off itself, destroying its host in the process. The racism, misogyny, and counter-rationality of the reactionary right in American politics for the last several years is a frightening exhibition of the destructive force of anger deliberately nourished by hate, encouraged to rule thought, invited to control behavior. I hope our republic survives this orgy of self-indulgent rage. I think for me, um, she was someone I could depend upon to get it, <laughs> to understand what I was doing. And I think that's what I was for her as well. And I said to her on one occasion, you're pretty clever. And she said, so are you. 